My name is Matthew Puffer. I'm a uh, fellow here at the Augustinian Institute at Villanova University. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Father Brian Hare and Professor Sally Scholes. Father Hare is currently the Parker Gilbert Montgomery Professor of the Practice of Religion and Public Life at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, as well as a faculty associate at the Carr Center for Human Rights and at the Saffer Center for Ethics and the Professions. Father Hare is a recipient of the MacArthur Award, the Martin E. Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion, and the Kennedy School's Carballo Award for Excellence in Teaching. He has held numerous appointments, including at the Harvard Divinity School and Georgetown University, and was a member of the Vatican delegation to the United Nations in 1973 and 1978. He also served on the staff of the US Catholic Conference of Bishops for two decades and was the staff director of the Catholic Bishop's Pastoral Letter, The Challenge of Peace, in 1983. Uh, there, famously, uh, he drew the world's attention to the presumption against harm in Augustine's writings, uh, as well as the presumption against war, and made the case uh, for their relevance for the wider just war tradition. His teaching, research, and writing focus on ethics and foreign policy, and the role of religion in world politics and in American society. Father Hare's paper this morning is titled, Just War Ethics and a Third Nuclear Age. Our respondent this morning, is Dr. Sally Scholes, professor and department chair in Villanova Department of Philosophy. Professor Scholes' research in social and political philosophy and feminist theory is available in many places, including four single-authored monographs, uh, several edited volumes, and more than 20 journal articles. She's published on numerous topics and figures, ranging from just war theory and war rape to varieties of solidarity, uh, political, economic, and social, and from Simone de Beauvoir to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, I will come back up after uh, the paper and response and field questions. Uh, Father Pear. Thank you, Matt, and let me express my appreciation for being invited to this conference friends and new friends I have been able to gain from during the last two days. And so now I come to my assigned task, and I think like some of my preceding speakers, there's a difference between the paper you write and the 35 to 40 minutes we are given. So let me uh, uh, begin by describing in a moment what I'll do. The Washington Post columnist George Will was the first, to my knowledge, to use the phrase, a third nuclear age. In the last few years, a number of political and strategic analysts have invoked the idea of the second nuclear age. This past year, Michael Sementa of the Charles University of Prague described the Trump's administration 218 nuclear posture review as a document for the third nuclear age. My purpose in invoking the phrase, the third nuclear age, is to use it to review the way the just war ethic has accompanied the nuclear age from 1948, uh, 1945 to 2018. So for my purposes, the first nuclear age refers to the period from 1945 to 1990 the second nuclear age from 1990 to 2000, and the third nuclear age covers the period from 2001 to the present. So again, reducing from paper to presentation, I'm going to summarize the first nuclear age, outline the second, and the third nuclear age will take up most of my presentation. The first nuclear age, the classical era, the first period might be termed the classical era of nuclear history because in this time the basic categories of nuclear strategy were set in place and initial moral assessments were made. 
The political strategic context for the classical period, which extended until 1990, was bipolar and nuclear, a bipolar world with nuclear weapons in the hands of the two major powers. The French analyst Raymond Aron described this first period as an unprecedented situation in international relations. The political strategic response to the bipolar nuclear world took shape conceptually in the late 1950s and the early 1960s. In his book, The Nuclear Question, Professor Michael Mandelbaum describes the emergence of a strategic synthesis which came to fruition by the mid-1960s. It did not begin with consensual views. Early positions within the government were divided between those who saw nuclear weapons as valuable and usable additions to the U.S. arsenal and those who with equal passion saw the weapons as threats which should be eliminated from the arsenal. Neither of these polar positions could be sustained over time. The use of the weapons was judged by almost all to be too costly in human terms, and the idea of complete disarmament was too difficult to achieve. What did survive in the policy process at the beginning of the first nuclear age were two complementary ideas, the doctrine of deterrence and the diplomacy of arms control. These two concepts served as the foundation of nuclear policy for the next 30 years. Deterrence and arms control sustained the relationship through times of conflict and collaboration. They did not offer a genuine peace, but they did provide, along with other factors, a way to avoid nuclear war. The intended effect of deterrence and arms control was labeled not peace, but, secure, but stability. Stability in turn meant that neither power should see any incentive in the first use of nuclear weapons. The consensus about stability, deterrence, and arms control was always contested. Politically, the critique extended from those who said deterrence was not enough to those who said that arms control was too feeble. This kind of commentary accompanied every nuclear summit, every congressional ratification of arms control treaties, and every administration. A critique of a different order involved moral evaluations of the nuclear age and the policies designed to address the age. The just war ethic was at the center of these moral debates, but it was not, all, all, but it was not alone Peace church advocates and disarmament movements were always part of the discussion. The just war analysis was pluralistic. Within a broad framework of the tradition that held that some uses of force were legitimate, but not all uses of force, a spectrum of positions developed. The initial focus was on the, on the atomic bomb and its implications was an opening chapter of a narrative of the just war which continued through the first nuclear age. The spectrum of positions can only be illustrated here and not analytically probed. The first position in the first nuclear age, which deserves mention, were those who had held the just war ethic until the nuclear age made it impossible in their mind and their research to do anything other than to declare nuclear strategy untenable in its totality. This nuclear pacifist position surfaced early in the United Kingdom but found inheritance throughout the Cold War. A second position, that of the dominant Christian theologian in the United States, Reinhold Niebuhr, requires a comment. Niebuhr did not hold the just war position explicitly. He found the theory to be an example of what he called Catholic rationalism, and he found that unpersuasive. But Niebuhr drew conclusions about war and peace, which were often close to those of the advocates of the just war position. 
Niebuhr, as a Protestant ethicist, was joined by another Protestant voice, Paul Ramsey from Princeton University. Ramsey engaged the nuclear age from 1960s until he retired. Ramsey believed throughout all this period that the just war argument was the basic tool to evaluate war and peace. He believed that the ethic had the capacity to shape a nuclear strategy which would be strategically effective and morally legitimate. He went to great lengths to develop his position on any use of nuclear weapons and the strategy of deterrence. To his great frustration, he found U.S. policy embodied in his mind an Im a murderous intent in its targeting doctrine. John Finnis of Oxford has reaffirmed Ramsey's position. These theological voices were joined in a powerful and influential way by the political philosopher Michael Walzer. Walzer espoused and enhanced the influence of just war ethics with his book Just and Unjust Wars. Walzer was a stronger critic of nuclear use than Ramsey was and a less stringent critic of deterrence. On use, while Walter recognized the possibility of a limited use of nuclear weapons, he argued, in fact, it would violate proportionality and discrimination. On deterrence, Walter staked out a not only distinctive but unique position. Using Churchill's idea of supreme emergency, meaning moments in history when principles temporarily do not bind or do not extend to the reality of a situation. Walzer then stated his famous judgment on deterrence. I quote, we threaten evil in order not to do it, and the doing of it would be so terrible that the threat seems in comparison to be morally defensible. This consequentialist tur a turn in Walzer's thought distanced him, distanced him from both Ramsey and another famous name, Father John Ford, SJ, in his classical article about the bombing of civilians. Each of these just war positions deserves a more fine-grained analysis not possible here. What I can offer as a poor substitute is what I would describe in summary as a median moral position that was worked out during the first nuclear age. The median position would be that the just war ethic led its proponents to argue against the use of nuclear weapons, but to find ways to support some concept of deterrence, usually arguing for counterforce targeting. Deterrence was not to be praised, but for many, also not to be condemned. It should be a scene, seen as a way station until arms control and diplomacy might put interstate relations on a firmer basis. The second nuclear age, a transitional decade. So in outline form, this is what I do. The decade is 1990 to 2000 the end of the Cold War, and then taking one up to the threshold of 9-11. I call it a transitional decade because it's located between the classical period and the period of the Age of Terror, as it became known in political science. And so the transitional decade was overshadowed by both of these. The character of this second transitional age was the following. Nuclear issues moved off center stage. At best, they were focused on nonproliferation, not the superpowers. While nuclear issues were relativized, the ethics of war were quite alive in two senses. So the 1990s produced two major kinds of the use of force that brought just war analysis into play. The first was Gulf War I, 1990 to 91. This is the kind of war that just war historically had been designed to address, an interstate conflict with aggression as the major argument. 
Walter had said aggression is the clearest example of what must be opposed by just war ethics. And so there was also a fit in the Gulf War between the UN Charter and the just war ethic. The judgment had its own complexity, but the ethic fit the argument and allowed people to make distinctions and differences within a general framework of finding the aggression something that needed to be opposed. The second use of force in the 1990s was very different. It comes under the title humanitarian military intervention. Very different than either the nuclear question or Gulf War I. Humanitarian military intervention involves internal war, not interstate war. It involves issues of international law and sovereignty. And how to address the relationship of these two, international war and sovereignty and just war, became the question. The moralists tended to be more interventionary than the lawyers were. And the moralists uh, ultimately worked out what might be called an ethic of just intervention, a rule-based exception to the non-intervention principle. So having uh, given you that summary of what I did in seven or eight pages, I want to keep within my bounds by turning to the third nuclear age without forgetting the first two. The third nuclear age, as it is used in this paper, basically coincides with the 21st century. The multipolar structure of the 1990s continued into the 2000s. Bipolarity was gone by 1990. And then the interpretation of what took its place varied. But generally, the argument that the world moved toward a multipolar framework uh, was the, the sort of consensus choice. The terrorist attacks of 9-11 brought the threat of transnational terrorism by non-state actors to the center of world politics. The non-proliferation treaty and the regime shaped by it had been for over 30 years focused on state-centric issues. The non-proliferation treaty reached back to the first nuclear age and was given more attention in the second nuclear age. After 9-11, the framework for policy on non-proliferation became two-dimensional. The question of proliferation by states and the proliferation by non-state actors focused the attention of diplomats and analysts. Cases of internal conflict from the second nuclear age continued into the third nuclear age with the cases of Syria and Libya. My intent is, is to focus on three questions in the third nuclear age and their relevance for the just war tradition. The three cases are first, the return of great power politics. Second, the doubts now expressed about deterrence. And thirdly, non-proliferation policy and military intervention. Great power politics. Every age and every international system features states designated as great powers. The first nuclear age went beyond this traditional discourse by describing superpowers as distinct from other great powers. The United States and the Soviet Union were in a class by themselves, so designated because of their nuclear capacity and their ability to shape a globally competitive foreign policy. Other states like England, France, Germany, Japan, India, and China played major roles in the last half of the 20th century, but they did so in the shadow of bipolarity until 1990. A distinguishing characteristic between the first and second nuclear ages was the intense global military competition of the first age and its dramatic disappearance after 1990. Russia, of course, remained a great power, but the superpower standoff was a memory in the 1990s, not an existential reality. The principal characteristic of the third age, in my view, 
is the revival and return of what I will call great power politics. The fact of the return is easily understood. The policy journals today are filled with articles like the return of geopolitics in foreign affairs. Secondly, a new Cold War in the national interest. Thirdly, explaining Beijing's assertiveness in the Washington Quarterly. These articles and many others set out to interpret the fact of the great power return. The historian Walter Russell Mead opens his article in Foreign Affairs with the comment, old-fashioned power plays are back in international relations. Mead's thesis is that, and I quote, in very different ways with very different objectives, China, Russia, and India, China, Russia, and Iran are all pushing back against the political settlement of the Cold War. Meade includes multiple states in his survey of what I have called the Third Age, but the, at the heart of his article is a resurgent Russia and a rising China engaging the United States and the position it held in the First and Second Age. Bipolarity is gone in the Third Age, and less dramatic but no less complex, a triangular relationship marks the Third Age and requires its own analysis. To the question of whether the Third Age is simply a new Cold War, the British historian Lawrence Friedman responded that while the Cold War I is not being exactly repeated, Cold War II does exist with its own character and deserves attention. Friedman is a master of precision. Some of the journal titles abroad today could be accused of a degree of hype, but not Friedman. I take his comment to mean that the new pattern of great power politics is less stark, less likely to create a Cuban Missile Crisis, but quite capable of creating political crises, which in turn could escalate. The pattern of great power relations today has three key dimensions. U.S.-Russia, U.S.-China, and Russia and China. The U.S.-Russia relationship has emerged in stages, driven in large part by the personality and policy of President Putin. Mr. Putin has brought with him to his second term as President of Russia a view of the past and a vision for the future. The past in this case is the collapse of the communist empire, which he, which he has described as catastrophic, and from which he seeks to lead Russia to a recovery. The vision of the future is to reestablish Russia as a great power resembling its historic role. Mr. Putin is a nationalist, and he has demonstrated in Ukraine and Syria that he possesses a strategic vision willing to use force selectively to enhance Russia's role in Europe and in the Middle East. In President Trump, the Russian leader encounters another nationalist, but a nationalist who lacks a coherent strategic vision. There may be such a vision somewhere in the Trump administration, but the president doesn't embody it or interpret it coherently. China's rise over the last 30 years has had an organic character to it. The leading edge of Chinese power has been its remarkable economic achievements domestically and internationally. Russia's recent challenge to the United States has been a return of political military competition. China now ranks as the second leading economy in the world. That dynamic achievement certainly has been a major feature of U.S.-China relations. But Xi Jinping has more recently, as president of China, woven China's economic status together with an expanding conception of the Chinese political strategic role in Asia. Chinese policies in the South China Sea and in East Asia have carefully but systematically challenged the U.S. role as an Asian power and as a defender of allies like Japan and South Korea. 
In his own way, Xi Jinping has a design for China's great power potential, recalling China's historic role and claiming a commanding presence in Asia and beyond. The third part of the relationship of great power politics is the relationship between Russia and China, which once again has attracted significant analytical attention. My colleague at Kennedy School, Graham Allison, asked recently whether China was seeking quotes to play the Russian card, end quote. The phrase recalls the Kissinger policy of opening relations with China after two decades of conflict so that the U.S. could place itself between China and Russia, seeking to be in closer relationship with both powers than each of them were with the other. A revitalized China-Russia relationship would open a range of issues political and strategic in character. Again, not simply a return of the 1950s, but a reality demanding attention. The description of the return of geopolitics leaves much unsaid here and may well be too compressed to offer a clear strategic picture of the moment. But as with any great power narrative, a military dimension runs through all of it. These developing great power relations have already produced strategic results. Darrell Kimball, the president of the Arms Control Association, in its journal, Arms Control Today, has spoken of what he calls a qualitative arms race, developing among these three powers. I quote, the United States and Russia are rushing forward with costly, ambitious plans to upgrade their Cold War nuclear arsenals and develop new types of destabilizing nuclear weapons, end quote. The U.S. contribution to this dynamic is a commitment made in the Obama administration and continued in the Trump administration, namely to spend $1 trillion over the next 30 years to modernize the U.S. nuclear arsenal. The Chinese are not spectators to this process, but participants proceeding at their own pace to stay current in the great power competition. The danger of all this is not restricted to the drive for new weapons. During the first nuclear age, the dangers of deterrence were moderated to a degree by efforts at arms control. Today, that restraint is close to being abandoned. For example, in 2018, the UN Secretary General spoke of the Cold War returning, but with a difference. I quote, the mechanisms and safeguards to manage the risks of escalation have existed in the past. They no longer seem to be present. It is not difficult to document the concerns of the Secretary General. The United States has now withdrawn from the SALT I Treaty, the so-called ABM Treaty, also withdrawn from the INF Treaty governing intermediate range weapons in Central Europe, and thus far the United States has not committed to a renewal of the 2010 nuclear New START Treaty. Reasons have been offered each time, citing changes in the strategic environment, but the end product threatens to be that no significant legal framework might soon exist between the U.S. and Russia. All of this, of course, makes the already tenuous status of the Non-Proliferation Treaty more fragile. Its fragility lies principally with the loss of confidence new that non-nuclear states increasingly express about the nuclear power's commitment to Article 6 of the treaty, to arms control and disarmament. Second characteristic of the third nuclear age is doubts about deterrence. In spite of the central role of the doctrine of deterrence that it played in the 20th century, there were always doubts about it expressed from various sources. The concept of maintaining stability, in quotes, by a threat which held humanity hostage, subjected deterrence theory to questioning and at times condemnation. 
But the critics were always muted by the political strategic consensus that flawed as it was, deterrence was the best solution states could produce. The third nuclear age, even in the face of a return to geopolitics, has generated a diverse chorus of arguments, recreating a constituency for nuclear disarmament. Early in the first age, there were arguments to go to nuclear disarmament as the solution. The inability to achieve that meant that that idea was left on the sideline. Today, within the United Nations and beyond it, there are calls, quotes, to go to nuclear zero, nuclear weapons. Three examples summarized by their characteristics and without trying to set forth their specific positions will illustrate the doubts now being advanced against deterrence and for disarmament once again. In the United States, the most surprising position has been advanced by four architects of nuclear policy over the last 50 years. George Shultz, Henry Kissinger, William Perry, and Sam Nunn. All four have served in senior positions in the US government, and they have contributed directly to the shaping of nuclear policy during and after the Cold War. Hence the surprise in and out of government when the four authored a series of essays in the Wall Street Journal asserting two basic propositions. First, nuclear states and others, they said, should commit to a goal of a nuclear-free world. Second, deterrence, they said, as designed and implemented during the classical Cold War context is now obsolete. The rationale of Schultz and others is that deterrence doesn't address the principal danger today, which is non-state actors getting access to nuclear weapons. In light of this foundational assertion, these four dissenters from deterrence set forth a body of policy initiatives which they acknowledge could begin the journey to nuclear zero, but it would be a long journey. A second voice for going to zero derives from a different place and follows a different path. The International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, is a coalition of 400 groups from global civil society which was awarded the Nuclear Peace Prize in 2017. Their venue for action is not so much the policy arena like Schultz, but rather their venue combines a global grassroots campaign with advocacy at the United Nations. Their chosen method is to pursue a treaty banning the use, possession, and deployment of nuclear weapons. They have advanced their case through the UN General Assembly, where they have garnered 60 signatures. Now, that does not mean ratification. There are 15 ratifications at my last count. The basis of the advocacy of ICANN is to focus on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear conflicts. The UN ran a major conference on this. The ICANN strategy is to concentrate on a multilateral approach that through states and aimed at a legally binding treaty. The strategy resembles that followed in campaigns to ban cluster munitions and landmines. The policy is based on a long-term perspective. Banning nuclear weapons would stigmatize them, the first step then disarmament would follow banning. The two approaches, Schultz and ICANN, converge in an ultimate goal, nuclear disarmament, which was advocated early in the first stage, but then ceded to arms control. Schultz's colleagues focus on US policy and policy makers. ICANN focuses on a global audience and advances broad themes of humanitarianism and multilateral coalition of states and civil society. A third voice being brought forward for disarmament and against deterrence is Pope Francis and the Holy See. The just war ethic is not solely a Catholic property, but the church has sustained the tradition for centuries. On the basis of this tradition, 
The church, Catholic Church, at least since 1963, has called for balanced, verifiable disarmament of nuclear weapons. But prior to this decade, it has not simply and unequivocally opposed the strategy of deterrence. The prototypical statement of the, uh, was that of John Paul II in 1982, in which he said, in, conditions, in current conditions, deterrence based on balance, certainly not as an end in itself, but as a step on the way toward a progressive disarmament may still be judged morally acceptable. John Paul II's statement reflects a prior judgment of the Second Vatican Council, which did not endorse deterrence, did not condemn it, but did condemn the intentional bombing of civilian centers. The third nuclear age has brought the Holy See in a number of interventions over the last five years to combine the call for disarmament and the moral critique of deterrence. An exemplary statement made in 2013 to the General Assembly of the United Nations called for a phased and verifiable elimination of nuclear arms and then said, quotes, the chief obstacle to starting this work is continued adherence to the doctrine of deterrence. With the end of the Cold War, the time for the acceptance of this doctrine is long past. Pope Francis reasserted a similar position on one of his press conferences coming home from an overseas trip to Bangladesh. He said, I'm convinced that we are at the limit of licitly having and using nuclear weapons, and, end quote. Stepping back from these three expressions of doubt about deterrence, it's possible to see a policy critique of deterrence in the Schultz position, a legal challenge to deterrence in the treaty, in the Ban Treaty, and moral rejection of deterrence from the Holy See. The three distinct overlapping positions have all emerged in the nuclear age. They have also emerged as a parallel reality to the return of great power politics. During the Cold War, criticism of deterrence and arguments for disarmament were made, but at times qualified by the recognition that the intense superpower relationship rendered deep immediate change in the nuclear relationship virtually impossible. A continuing question for the third age will be whether any similar restraint and the critique of nuclear policy arises. The third major question after great power politics and then doubts about deterrence is the question of nonproliferation again, tied now to the proposition of military intervention as a possibility uh, to, uh, of nonproliferation policy. I play that out in more detail where we turn to it in just a moment. So now I come to the final statement. Just war ethics, themes for the third age. The choice made in this paper of issues representing the third age could have been expanded. They are simply examples of a much broader field of inquiry. But even with the limit of three, it's not possible to do them justice. Casuistry of the old fashioned kind is needed case specific, examined with details assessment. The moralist should remember what the late John Courtney Murray used to say to moralists. The question of fact precedes the question of norms. Brief translation, do not move to moral judgment before you have a secure grasp of the factual complexity of the issue. So there's neither time nor space for casuistry here. Let me make three assertions. What the third nuclear age needs is a political ethic, a strategic ethic, and a transnational ethic. Great power politics and political ethics. Those authors who have warned of the return of geopolitics are on to something which cannot be safely ignored or wished away. But great power politics do not have to end in great power war. They often have in the past, but not inevitably so. 
The difference between politics and war as an outcome is exemplified in the contrast between the European theater between 1870 and 1914, and then the European theater from 1914 to 1918. My point here is modest. The political ethic needed today should be focused on containing great power competition within boundaries short of war. Indeed, even asking for the search for limited collaboration. In the midst of the Cold War, my mentor, Stanley Hoffman, used to argue that US policy should be marked by an ethic of restraint. Neither Hoffman then nor I believed that an ethic of restraint is a complete formula for major powers. Such powers in a still anarchic international system have some duties, including those which may come from chapter seven of the charter. But as the just war ethic holds, force is the last resort, not the first choice. It was not wrong for the UN and the US to collaborate in Somalia in 1993 intervention and some major power should have acted in Rwanda. Political ethics finds its home and method in diplomacy. Neither political ethics nor diplomacy can succeed without some instrument of threatened coercion. But in the age of a renewal of great power politics, a political ethic should protect and promote the primacy of diplomacy over force. An interesting case is is the Ukraine. The Russian invasion of in Ukraine and reoccupation of Crimea can be classified by law and morality as aggression inviting a military response. But just cause without other considerations is not sufficient in the nuclear age for crossing the boundary between forceful diplomacy and simply using force. Doubts about deterrence and strategic ethics. I have not been totally surprised by the Holy See's move calling for nuclear disarmament and then the critique of, dis, uh, of deterrence. I was more surprised by the Schultz and Kissinger positions. But their con conclusions converge with the Holy See's position even though the character of their positions appropriately differ. The Schultz position is basically a political strategic argument although in support of a moral goal. The Holy Father's judgment is a moral condemnation of the strategic reality of deterrence as a policy. The return of an age of great power politics will not change Pope Francis's teaching. It could alter the Schultz position. The four authors did publish an addendum of sorts in support of efforts to redesign deterrence policy. My point in this section on strategic ethics is that even if one holds a position of moral condemnation or critique of deterrence, as it is, there will still be a useful political and moral role to reshape the character of deterrence as one seeks to move away from it. My guess is that not all the participants in the moral debate will find that sentence persuasive. Many will choose to place all efforts into reinforcing the condemnation without further commentary. An alternative view which I would support would be to support the goal of going to zero, to render a final judgment against deterrence, but to be involved in how deterrence may be being shaped, even in more dangerous ways, or how it could be shaped in a more positive way. And so on, in terms of the strategic ethic, that is where I would go. The final question I will not play out. My main point is there is a danger that the exceptions on humanitarian grounds that were made to override non-intervention in the second era could be expanded today by states to say intervention to prevent proliferation is a legitimate policy. Outside a chapter seven justification for that and a designation of a multilateral way of doing it, I would decisively oppose a single state arguing that military intervention is an appropriate way to deal with nonproliferation. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that um, uh, incredible uh, uh, piece of, of uh, thought um, in history of the nuclear ages and, and uh, how just war has adapted. I'm truly honored and more than a little intimidated uh, to be in this position as a respondent to Professor Brian Hare. For nearly 50 years, he has been at the center of moral and political debates, interpreting and developing just war theory for generations of policymakers, moral theorists, and military and political leaders. He is the epitome of the engaged teacher scholar that so many of us in academia aspire to be. His work matters. And as a democratic people, and here at Villanova, a people of faith, we would do well to sit up and pay better attention. Professor Hare has given us a lot to think about this morning. The three nuclear ages, from 1945 to 1990, from 1990 to 2000, and from 2001 to the present, are marked, as he explained, not only by, different, uh, by the different role or stature of great powers, but also by different attitudes or orientations toward deterrence and disarmament. In the first nuclear age, the two great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, pursued in their policies deterrence and arms control with the precarious goal of stability. In the second, nuclear ethics did not take center stage as the world community confronted the need to intervene in internal wars. The third nuclear age is characterized by the nuclear uh, relations between, as he explained, the US and Russia, the US and China, and uh, Russia and China. This new great power structure is described as both less dangerous and more precarious as restraint is close to being abandoned. Hence the doubts about deterrence and the need for a discussion of disarmament. Simultaneously, the just war tradition grew and adapted to these nuclear ages. In the first, as Professor Hare discusses, the focus was on use and bellow obligations. Nuclear pacifists hold that nuclear weapons uh, make war unwinnable, and the devastating effects of nuclear weapons will always violate the principles of discrimination and proportionality. This is not the only just war uh, position in the first nuclear age, and Hare cites the influential work of Paul Ramsey, who argued along just war lines for deterrence, deterrence and limited use. In the second nuclear age, just war theory and tradition was transformed by the challenges posed by gross humanitarian crises and the need to intervene militarily. In the third nuclear age, Professor Hare challenges just war theory to develop a political ethic, a strategic ethic, and a transnational ethic. The political ethic, as he just uh, mentioned, uh, focuses on containing great power competition within the boundaries short of war via diplomacy. The strategic ethic condemns the strategic reality of deterrence as policy, but seeks to reshape the character of deterrence and set limits on the changes that could otherwise prove more dangerous. And the transnational ethic seeks to articulate the limits of military intervention for humanitarian purposes. Professor Hare's analysis of the nuclear ages and the transformations of just war theory are telling. They illustrate the need both to revisit the roots of the just war tradition, as well as the need to see it ever developing. I note that the three nuclear ages discussed by Professor Hare correspond to or correlate with three ages of democracy as well. The period prior to the Second World War witnessed a collapsing of democracy worldwide. In 1943, there were only nine democracies in the world. But from 43 to 1989, that number grew to 52. Moreover, the share of the world's population living in democracy grew from 221 million in 1945 to 2.3 billion in 1990. This undoubtedly played a role in the shaping of politics and the policies of the great powers during the first nuclear age. Of course, we know the history. Many of, perhaps even most of these emerging democracies were also tools of the two great powers. But it's worth noting that the rise of democratic politics on the ground, sorry, it's worth noting of the rise of democratic politics on the ground. The people themselves played a role. Consider the movements to throw off the yoke of colonialism, the protests to claim civil rights, the marches and demonstrations against the Vietnam War. In spite of the corrupt way the so-called superpowers manipulated emerging democracies to pursue their own Cold War ends, 
These democratic movements, together with the global rise in democracy as a system of rule, announced a new era, era of civic engagement or citizen involvement. By 1990, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were 63 democracies in the world. By 2000, that number had grown to 80. The share of the world's population living in a democracy grew to 3.4 billion. This post-Cold War decade, the second nuclear age, saw a steep rise in democracy worldwide. The spread of democracy globally correlated with the first and the second nuclear ages also carries with it the markers and outcomes of increased democracy. Democratic countries tend to be richer and healthier. There's also a correlation with increased education, although the attribution is frequently reversed. That is that countries with increases in educational accomplishment tend to move toward democracy. Nonetheless, there's evidence to show that increased democratization leads to better educational systems and outcomes as well. Democratic regimes also protect human rights better. This faith in democracy was shattered uh, by the terrorist attacks on 9-11. Although the numbers continue to rise, 4.1 billion people were living in a democratic regime in 2015. The nature of democracy had changed with 9-11. The state took on, stronger, uh, on a stronger guise as protector, directing the so-called legitimate use of force internally as well as externally. National security, rather than welfare, human rights, and education, dominated the political airwaves in this third uh, nuclear age. This focus on national security and responding to terror brought about radical shifts in the experience of democracy for citizens. Privacy, individual rights, political participation were in varying ways transformed, compromised, or eroded. Also notable during this era is the increased spending on the military, especially in the United States. Often at the expense of basic infrastructure improvements, increased funding for education, and creative welfare programs for the most vulnerable among us. The third nuclear age correlates in interesting ways with these changes in democracy and the dramatic growth in economic inequality in the United States and worldwide. If, as I've suggested, the nuclear ages track the rise and changes in democracy over the last 75 years, then what are we to expect to see in uh, what I and others would suggest is a new age of democracy that started sometime in the last four years with the rise of populism, the election of autocrats, the erosion of civility, and the profound loss of faith in democratic elections and governments. One way of reading the changes in democracy since 2001 is as a reaction to the focus on national security in the face of global terror, as we've heard. Whereas the period prior to about four years ago, from 2001 to about 2015, 16, the focus of national security was on the security portion of that term, utilizing the methods of international cooperation and diplomacy to address the changing nation state landscape and the rise of non-governmental actors. The last few years focus on the national portion of that term, national security. Which leads me to wonder if we should begin to think about or talk about a fourth nuclear age that overlaps a bit with the third, but might be increasingly standing apart. Are the changes we are witnessing in democracy affecting also a change in nuclear history? This fourth nuclear age terrifies me. It announces an isolationist policy with unstable actors, and I'm not only referring here to the US, Russia, and China. I think there's something importantly different about this new political landscape. We still have and we still need uh, to focus on the three great powers characteristic of that third nuclear age. But the landscape of politics, the erosion of democratic norms, and the weaponization of rhetoric, to say nothing of the rhetoric of weaponization, should give us pause as we think about just war theory and nuclear weapons. I go into that a little bit deeper, but I'll, I'll skip that so that we can have more discussion here. For just war theorists, especially just war theorists committed to the nation state system, this age signals the potential for further weakening of the principles of just cause and last resort. Together with the longer term concern over the weakening of the principles of proportionality in the nuclear era. As democratic people, intellectuals engaged in debate and discussion about the ethics of war, we need to ask about our own responsibilities in the third and possibly a looming fourth nuclear age. That is, I wonder if we need a collective ethic 
to accompany the three, the political ethic, the strategic ethic, and the transnational ethic that Professor Hare suggests. As I envision it, a collective ethic holds democratic citizens responsible for policies, strategies, and actions conducted in their name. But more to the point, it empowers us to take action to form collectives that, uh, that have the power to influence governments. It is an ethic uh, that challenges the feedback loops and um, factionalizing of some democratic politics as it plays out in social media uh, or in um, uh, partisan airways these days. It is a response, too, to the principle Michael Walzer employs drawing from the philosophical memoir of Glenn Gray, which states, quote, the greater the possibility of free action in the communal sphere, the greater the degree of guilt for evil deeds done in the name of everyone. Professor Harris cites the important work of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. This global civil society organization serves as a good model for what a collective ethic asks of individuals in local contexts. A good analogy. As Walzer asserts, the more one can do, the more one has to do. A collective ethic also takes us uh, back to the roots of the just war tradition. This being an Augustinian institution, uh, and given that I'm the last respondent of the conference, it seems only fitting that Augustine get the last word. Augustine held that war is to be waged in order that peace may be obtained. As we think about the three nuclear ages with the possibility of a fourth and the challenges they bring to just war theory, our thinking together unites our intellects and hearts. In this spirit of friendship, forged during the Ethics of War Conference itself, we might begin to see the collective ethic take hold. As Augustine says, the friendship which draws human beings together in a tender bond is sweet to us because out of many minds it forges a unity. From the Confessions. All right, once again, we have about 15 minutes for questions, and I'm going to uh, offer Father Hare the opportunity to say something briefly in response to what uh, Professor Scholes has offered, uh, and then we'll open up. I'll try and keep track of hands. Professor Schultz and I talked before this conference. This is the second round for us. We were on together at the inauguration of, professor, uh, of the president of this university. So we're going to do a third one in the fourth nuclear age afterwards. <laughs> but I, her point, uh, I, she raised the fundamental point that wasn't even mentioned in my paper, and that is the whole question of democracy as it cuts across these three ages. And democracy is crucial uh, if you think about the function of the just war ethic. Uh, John Courtney Murray used to say that the just war ethic had two different audiences. The first audience was that the ethic was supposed to set the right terms for public policy debate. That in this exceptional case of war, that there needed to be a specific structure of moral reasoning. And his point was that the just war ethic gave you the capacity to develop a policy ethic, not only to develop a set of abstract norms, but to develop a set of ideas that could engage the political strategic debate and address itself to those who made policy. But the second audience of the just war ethic were individuals, people who at moments of war are asked by the state to kill and die for the state, and that the general populace is asked to support that. And Murray's point was, at that level, the function of the just war ethic was to form individual consciences, not only just of Christians or Catholics or religious believers, but to cast this theory in terms that those who do not share religious belief may find a moral wisdom that ties them together. Now, democracy adds a third dimension to that, and that is, in a democracy, not only are those who make policy morally responsible, but the constitution of the democracy means that the citizens of a state that engage in the use of force also are held morally responsible, and the function of the just war ethic 
is to provide a framework that a pluralist population could talk about that. Democracy, in fact, is a great addition to anything that I said because it gets to the roots of how moral theory works in a democratic uh, populace. So I saw two hands in the back here, uh, in the middle in the back with the red uh, shawl. Um, this is a, a question that has to do with the United States and Russia in particular. My understanding is that most of our debt that's furnished, uh, furnishing the military is uh, with China. I know China has purchased humongous famous buildings and sections of New York. In a drive through Iowa, there are little signs that say, this farm is not owned by China. Um, those <laughs> um, I know there are toll roads in Indiana that are owned by China. And so I'm wondering, if China decides that they want to um, collect on the debt, how is that going to make a, real, uh, a difference in this nuclear age? I already told uh, Matt that I'm going to need help with questions. My hearing aids don't translate well in this hall. How is China? So the question is, uh, given uh, the investment of China in American infrastructure in various ways, uh, how would it affect the third nuclear age should China decide at some point to collect on these debts or call these debts uh, into payment? Well, when you take me into the realm of political economy, I never have complete sentences. So I, I, ha I, I have to apologize for what I'm going to say. But the question points out that the world is marked by two different logics in the world that has emerged over the last 40 to 50 years. You have a political strategic logic based on the conception of the sovereign state, the sovereign territorial state. That doesn't mean state boundaries are not porous, they are. But you have a second logic in political economy, which is the globalization logic. And the essence of the globalization logic is that it creates dynamic forces and ties that cut across the boundaries of sovereign territorial states. So when you manage foreign policy today in the language of the discipline of international relations, you no longer have the classical high policy issues of war and policy. You have the new high policy issues of politics and economics. So the Chinese do have a kind of hold to some degree on us um, in terms of the way we have dealt together. In a moment of real crisis about war and peace, I don't think that hold would have decisive effect on policy. And that's why we need an ethic of the political strategic in order to make sure that we don't just respond to the ties of globalization with the resort to force when that's not necessary. So I had one question back here. Please uh, try to catch my eye if you want to get in line here. Great. Um, my question has to do with um, our collective responsibility as citizens of a country that have actually used, the only citizens who have used the atomic bomb on human targets how ought we remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And how might that be different from how the narrative that continues in our society today about the atomic bombs ending a war and saving American lives? A narrative that maybe assuages our conscience, but I believe is historically unsustainable. So how ought we remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And why does it matter how we remember it in terms of how it might inform our theology and our thinking about what constitutes uh, just use of uh, nuclear weapons? Yes, I think the fact that we use these weapons is uh, on our conscience from beginning to end and will not go away over the historic period. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, 
indeed, the story of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if you think about it in moral terms, has to trace back before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1944, John Ford, American Jesuit, wrote an extensive article on the morality of obliteration bombing. And the argument was that while there was a just cause to go to war against the Axis power, the war was being pursued with unjust means in terms of obliteration bombing. And so the, the point that was made from that article, it was written in 1944, so it was before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The point was, that was made that Ford made in passing at the very end of the article is that we've crossed a bridge already. And there was a tone of the article, not specifics, that we will regret it. Now, the interesting counterpoint to that article, not counterpoint, but complement, is probably the best single political history of the nuclear age, in my view. It was written by McGeorge Bundy, former national security advisor and historian. Bundy wrote uh, a 500-page book on danger and survival, talking about how political decisions were made in the nuclear age. When Bundy gets to the decision to drop the, he writes a chapter on the decision to drop the bomb, Bundy makes the point that in the context of the policy discussion, no one, no one in the upper reaches of the American government simply said, we don't bomb civilians. And his point was that bridge had been passed in, in, uh, by both the Axis powers and the Allies powers. And it's the way when a moral principle goes off the table, then the people forget even what restraint should mean. So that's the original event. It will always be there. How does it affect today? I think it affects today the way anyone, if I can use theological argument, anyone who's committed serious sin uh, must carry that sense even after they've been forgiven as a pause when they're engaged in other activities. So uh, the engagement in war will always carry that memory. That doesn't decide specifically what you do about the engagement of war, but it also carries a burden that should not be forgotten. Memory makes a difference, even though other things have to come into play to decide what you will do under new conditions. So I have two questions here, and I'm going to ask we have uh, both questions right in a row and then give Father Hare an opportunity to respond to both of them as he will. Uh, Larry Udall, and then uh, the gentleman in front of him. Thank you. Uh, I thought when you mentioned a third nuclear age in this century, I was kind of expecting that part of it might involve the possibility of non-state actors getting their hands on nuclear weapons and how that would play into things, and maybe it doesn't, and that hasn't happened yet, but uh, I just wondered your thoughts on that. Right. Well, I, I well, just one, in defense of the paper, I did mention it twice. <laughs> it is non-proliferation policy was state-centric until the recent period of time. It now is state-centric and non-state actor-centric. <clears throat> and then secondly, uh, under the non-proliferation treaty, uh, the, the, that question isn't even handled under the non-proliferation treaty. So there's a serious question here uh, it, that is different. And to some degree, it goes back to the double logic of world politics, political strategic with the imagery of state boundaries and territorial states, and then political economic, uh, which, which goes in the direction of interdependence, ties across national boundaries, et cetera. What makes proliferation much more difficult regarding states and non-state actors is the democratization of nuclear knowledge and the globalization of fissionable markets. So you have two different themes that make it easier to have access and for non-state actors to have access. Now, non-state actors normally will not have missiles and bombers. So the, the danger is the danger of a bomb in a suitcase, but that it comes from uh, the democratization of nuclear knowledge. It is not hard to know how to produce these today. 
It's hard to implement weaponization of, but not to produce them. And the key to arms control and disarmament is controlling fissionable material. That is a fundamental key. And so that, that it's very much doubled the agenda of the policy ethic. I think I have time for one last question. Thank you. My name is Bill Hartman. Um, so listening to your both presentations, I'm struck with the idea that we're maybe, and it was referenced this morning in the first presentation, this uh, almost like a devolving of the American or democracy in general taking place. It's kind of shrinking isolationist issues. At the same time that we're seeing, you know, we're, we're facing possibly the ex this sixth extinction they talk about, the loss of life species across the globe, um, the rise of migratory people and animals throughout the world. We're talking like 60 million people are on the move right now and have no home to go to. Um, so as all of that takes place and we try to close our borders and create sort of like a, a cave that we can live in somehow, how do we hold on to just war when everything seems to be coming at all these different states? I think China is going to have a similar problem in India. Um, but thinking about just war and the issue of nuclearism, which was sort of like the genie out of the bottle that we can't put back now. So how do we, res how do we kind of reverse field on that or how do we save life and the planet is my question, I guess. That's a big one. <laughs> well, one thing is not everything could be solved by war. I mean, that war is to some degree an irrelevant activity for some of the threats that arise. Second thing is that once again, if you use this double logic, which is my only way of trying to understand the world today as you move beyond specific problems, uh, globalization will produce a multiplicity of challenges, some of them helpful and some of them not helpful and, the, uh, and dangerous. But uh, war is not an instrument of universal policy. That is to say, indeed, what the just war doctrine says, I think, is that you should, you, in a moral sense, you should re, uh, contain the use of force to very specific kinds of challenges, and that other kinds of challenges not only are morally inappropriate, but war won't solve them uh, because they're of the nature of the problem. They require a different set. It is the old story that if a man has a hammer, he keeps looking for a nail, and there may not be a nail that is uh, described by some of the challenges you talked about. Thank you so much, uh, Father Hare and Professor Schultz.